Right, so it is day 111 of my attempt to plant a tree for every single day in 2023. Um, and so far so good, so let's get on with it. Right, so yesterday I planted a tree that is more or less immortal, and today I am planting more or less the opposite of that. So this is one of the few trees that does have a best before date the moment it goes into the ground. Uh, so whereas there are a lot of trees which can change their environmental conditions to a point that they're not really going to thrive anymore, so things like a lot of the acacias will often found a woodland that will become inhospitable to them and then they'll rot and die. Um, very few trees have a built-in best before date, and there are a handful of palms that do fit that description. And so today is Caryotomitis, which is sometimes called the Burma fishtail palm, as you might guess from that name. It's from a sort of area of South Asia and Indonesia. Um, and it is quite, quite interesting in several ways. So, so the first way it's quite interesting is, of course, that best before date, but we'll get into that later. But the second way is it's quite weird even for a palm in terms of its structure. So palms are usually either palmate or pinnate, which is to say the structure of their leaf is either like the palm of a hand, with so, so the individual leaf is like a flattened palm with fingers coming off in all the little leaflets, or it's pinnate, which is to say it has a central uh, central rib off which the different pinnae of the leaf come off like a feather. So you can think of the first as being groups like the sabbles and the barasses, and you can think of the second of being things like the date palms and things like the carpenterias. Uh, this is a pinnate palm, but it's actually a bipinnate palm, so as well as having the midrib have leaflets coming off that, those leaflets then have their own leaflets come off them, which is very atypical for palms. Um, Currently it's still in its juvenile state, so all of its leaves are still simple pinnate, but they are getting towards the stage where they will become bipinnate. The other way it is sort of comparable and contrastable to yesterday's planting is yesterday's planting, being a fig, is one you do not want to plant close to any permanent structures because figs have incredibly invasive root systems. So those spread out and they get into structures, they get into pipes, they, they tear things apart very, very well. Even quite small fig trees are best kept away from buildings and wells because of that reason. So most of the time, palms are actually quite good for planting close into buildings because as much as their leaves flap about a lot, they are generally pretty stable, quite wind resistant for the most part, and their root system is not usually very invasive. We do have a couple of species which have very long tap roots, and mostly the Central African ones have long tap roots. But for the most part, they have fairly small root balls, which don't really interfere with much. They're quite weak roots, so they're not too inclined to damage things. And they spread them out quite evenly, and it's quite stable, but quite easy to move if you need to. This is true of the fishtail palm, but the trouble is what's above ground with a fishtail palm doesn't seem so stable. So this is actually probably the least problematic, and it is usually the most common one around Zambia. Um, but it does tend to topple. So what happens is they will be planted, they will come up for about sort of six to 10 years, and depending on the conditions, then they will flower. And when they finish flowering, they just fall over. Um, sometimes you do get with the single stemmed ones, just a little bit of wind and they will topple over because they do have a lot more of a tendency to catch wind than most other palms. These are not an open area palm. These are very much a forest edge or deep within a forest palm which does mean you see a lot of them looking very yellow because people plant them in full sun. So even before they've got to that flowering and then senescing point, they are not at their best because th this is not a palm that wants full sun, especially not in sort of moderately high altitudes within the tropics. This is a palm that you plant underneath other trees, and so I'm planting it deep within a guava thicket where it should be nicely protected from any excessive sunlight, and it's a long, long way from any buildings or any wires or anything that it could damage by toppling over. This is one of the clumping ones, uh, so it won't be a complete loss when it falls over. It will send up some other shoots around the base, which it's already got a couple of, because even when they're small, they start doing that. And that will also reduce how much mass falls down, because there is a sort of cushion to that. You do see a lot of people will cut those ones off to make it look tidier. And if you really want that effect, there are a whole bunch of species. I think there's 15 species in the genus, and most of them are solitary. So if you really want that solitary palm effect, go with one of those and plant it along long, long, long way from any buildings or structures because it is going to come down and sometimes they go up very, very fast, so they're very popular for people creating a sort of instant landscape in their garden, um, but they will also create an instant hole of devastation when they do come down. The fruits of this palm aren't edible, which is also fairly unusual in palms. They do seem to be edible to most wildlife, so even within its native range, the macaques will eat it, and those are pretty closely related to the vervet, so I'm hoping they won't have any trouble with the toxins either. Uh, it's also eaten by bats and rodents and birds without any real problems. The oxalates in it are processed quite readily by most birds, bats, and rodents. It does have a lot of oxalates in the flesh of the fruit, which will burn your fingers and, and mouth if you try and eat it. So you'll usually learn before you swallow it and it does any damage to your kidneys and in internal systems. Um, 
It is not, however, completely inedible to humans because the seed within the fruit is edible, provided you get rid of the, the, the sort of seed coating. Uh, it is used in a similar way to the betel nut, which is not one that I would recommend eating because it, uh, it is a known carcinogen. I don't know if this is a carcinogen like the betel nut is, but I personally won't be eating it. However, what I probably will be doing is I will be trying to tap this for jaggery because this is one of several palms that you can cut the flower stem and collect the sap from the flower stem and then boil that off to make a thick sugary substance. Uh, you can leave that for about 12 hours without boiling it and get a wine if you so desire. Uh, it can also be processed for saga and because this is a clumping palm it's quite convenient for that. However, it's supposed to be quite a low quality one and because I'm not particularly keen on cutting up a palm to, to pound it for starch, I probably won't be doing that, but it is something that can be done with this if you are starving. Um, to protect it from such things as might cause it harm, which are relatively few, this is a pretty hardy palm provided it's not in too much sunlight, I will be planting a nice little piece of shell ginger, which is Alpinia zerambet, which is one you can use to make a tea. I believe it can be used as a spice as well, but there's other species of Alpinia which are better for that. It's got a lovely smell when you break the tuber though. But that's going to be going in, and that should form a nice little thicket around the base of this. That should also support the mass of the central trunk when it does flower and fall. It should stop it sort of squashing everything in its path when it does come tumbling down. Um, and then I will be putting in a couple of pieces of Calanco prolifera as well, which is one of the Madagascan Calancos, which should be a nice little toxic barrier just in case anything feels it wants to nibble on a fairly toxic palm, um, it's going to in encounter something quite differently toxic on its way there. Right, so that should be everything for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't enjoy it, thank you very much for watching this far anyway. Um, please did, do tune in again tomorrow if you did enjoy it, because I will be planting something else. I don't know what yet, but we will be finding out together. Right, your eyes do not deceive you. That does look like a little piece of silver, and that was all I noticed initially. This little guy, so this is another Argyrodes. You can see where the Argyre comes in there, because it really does look like silver. This is one of the pirate spiders, but she seems to be living alone right now. I have seen this a few times around, so I don't know if they do just occasionally build their own webs, um, and then just sneak in when they have the opportunity, or if they are sort of just resting between the stressful situation of being a pirate to, to settle down and have babies because she does look pretty gravid there. But that is Argyrodes up close and personal without the interference of a great big uh, trichonephala web to make it hard to spot her. But yeah, beautiful little pirate spider.